Hi guys, welcome to today's lesson. So today we will be talking about male reproductive anatomy in our livestock species. So when we talk about male reproductive anatomy, it's sort of like a manufacturing plant, um, kind of like a mass production plant, similar to the Ford car assembly line. And what it's assembling are sperm cells. So when we talk about the primary function of the male reproductive system, essentially we want the end product, which is firma, fertile sperm um, or spermatozoa. So that's the primary product of this sperm factory that is the male reproductive system. Now, there are other products that come from the male reproductive system. We have hormones and we have seminal fluids that help support the sperm cells and help ensure that they are created in the first place. But really our primary product here are fertile sperm because without those fertile sperm, we cannot make babies. So ultimately, this is the goal of the male system. So we're going to talk a little bit about these primary structure, structures of the male repro tract. Again, if you take a repro class, you're going to learn about more um, than just these structures. There are other structures that we're not going to be covering, but for the purpose of an intro class, these are kind of your primary structures. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they are and what they do. And we're going to start with the testes. So the testes are where I'm not going to say where the magic happens because that's silly. Not really silly. It's true. Um, so the testes are where the sperm cells are produced. So this is kind of like your assembly line. Um, this is where <clears throat> the cells start off and they divide. And eventually, once they come out of the testicles, they will resemble sperm cells. They won't be fully functional, but they will be fully put together. Um, so you can think of the testes or the testicle as the primary, uh, or the primary goal of the testicle is to produce sperm cells. Um, testosterone is also produced in the testicle. So single is testicle, testes are both, right? And males have two. Um, the amount of output potential that the testicles have is kind of amazing. Um, sperm cell production, daily sperm cell production can range from you know, 1 billion up to 25 billion sperm cells produced per day, depending on the species that you're talking about. So if you're talking in the billions, that's roughly 35,000 to 290,000 sperm cells that are made in the testicle per second. It's amazing the amount of work that the testicles do. <clears throat> so next is the scrotum. So the scrotum is responsible for housing the testicles. Um, one of the big things that the scrotum does is protects the testicles from injury. So the scrotum is a combination of skin and muscle, and there are muscles in the scrotum that help um, draw the testicles up closer to the body and lower them away from the abdomen. So when a male is threatened, so um, if they are fighting or if there's something attacking them um, and they have to flee or fight, the body will actually draw those testicles up closer to the abdominal cavity to keep injuries from happening. And the scrotum helps with that. There are other muscles that help with that as well, but the scrotum is one of them um, that does that fight or flight um, injury response there. 
So the scrotum also helps regulate the temperature of the testes. So if the testes were inside the abdominal cavity, and we talked a little bit about cryptorchids already, right? When the testicles are inside the abdominal cavity, it is too hot for sperm cells in there. And so if the testicles remain in the abdominal cavity, that animal doesn't produce viable sperm cells. Um, the sperm cells have to be maintained at a temperature that's between four and six degrees centigrade, lower than the body temperature. And the scrotum helps with this um, by exposing the testicles to blood flow that is exposed to the outer air, and it works kind of like a cooling system. So when the animal is growing um, in utero, those testes develop in the abdomen. And then eventually during fetal development, they descend down into the scrotum. And that's where they are housed for the remainder of the animal's life. For the majority of our livestock species, those testicles are in the scrotum um, either at birth or pretty much within a day or two following birth. After that, if they are not descended into the scrotum, they probably aren't going to, which can lead to a couple different problems. So the main problem that we worry about when the testicles remain in the abdominal cavity is uh, cryptor cryptorchidism. All right, cryptorchidism is a condition where either one of the testicles or both of the testicles don't descend from the abdomen into the scrotum and remain instead in the abdominal cavity. So remember we talked about some of our pigs that were born cryptorchids um, a couple months, well, probably even about three months back now that those um, little pigs were born. Um, and we had to have those testicles surgically removed so fortunately, um, none of our goats have had that problem recently, but we did have a litter of pigs that had three of the four males that were born in that litter were cryptorchid, which was unfortunate. So we have two different uh, types of cryptorchidism. One of them is the bilateral cryptorchid. So in a bilateral cryptorchid, neither one of the testes are going to descend from the abdomen. So both of them will remain up in the abdomen and you're not going to be able to see those testicles in the scrotum at all. And when we have this condition, when a male has this condition, um, the male is still producing testosterone. The testicles are still producing the sperm cells. They're still producing everything they're supposed to be. Uh, the difference being that because it's so hot, those sperm cells die very quickly or they are made dead. Um, but because the testosterone is still being produced, those males are going to be exhibiting secondary sex characteristics. So remember from our previous set of slides that secondary sex characteristics include things like a deepening voice and male aggression and marking their territory and you know that broad head, lots of fat deposition. Um, all of those things are secondary sex characteristics for these males. So they're still going to look like a mature male. The difference being that if you looked at their semen, there won't be any viable sperm cells. So they will be sterile. So this is a problem, right? Obviously, if we have our breeding males, we're not going to you know, get very far with these guys as breeding males. But another problem exists if we tried to sell them just as a market animal because they do still make testosterone. So that means that the meat, the taste, the flavor of the meat is still going to be affected. It's going to be like that animal is intact because they are intact. You just can't see those testicles, right? So if you plan on using this animal for meat, those testicles need to be removed surgically. Um, if you're talking about horses, then those animals will need to be gelded surgically, which is kind of a pain in the neck. Um, it can get expensive. We had to have those pigs uh, sterilized surgically and they had to go all the way down to willows. They had to go under general anesthesia. They had a major incision with stitches. Um, so there's a lot 
that goes into getting an animal essentially neutered surgically, all right? So we really try and avoid this if possible. So the bilateral cryptorchid means that neither of the testicles descend, and then we also have the unilateral cryptorchid. So that means there is one testicle that descends into the scrotum from the abdomen, and then the other one stays up in that abdominal cavity. So these guys, unlike the bilateral cryptorchid, are usually fertile because one of those testicles is working the way it's supposed to, but then the other one is contained up inside the abdominal cavity. So why do we care about this? Why don't we just use these animals because they are producing sperm? Well, there's a couple different reasons. One of them is that they are going to have a lower sperm count because only one of the testicles is producing viable sperm cells. And the other reason being that these animals can pass this condition on to their offspring. It is very heritable, and it's just not a condition that we want to be passing along to our offspring. Because again, we're gonna have lower sperm counts because only one of the testicles is working. So it's just not ideal, um, and we don't generally keep these animals, these um, you know single testicled animals. So you have to, you know, essentially castrate them. Um, and with some cases, you will have to castrate them surgically, just like the bilateral cryptorchids. So the next part of the male reproductive anatomy is the epididymis. So the epididymis has kind of three primary functions, and you will need to know um, all of these. So the epididymis is this very convoluted tube um, that connects the testicles with the ductus deferens. And we're gonna talk about the ductus deferens in a minute, but it is this part, see this blue part that runs along the outside of the testicle? This is all the epididymis here. Okay, and if you were looking at the epididymis of an actual animal, you would notice little teeny tiny squigglies all through here because this looks on the outside like one big tube, but it's actually a very, very tiny tube that is coiled and convoluted that is contained, you know, all along here. So it's a really long trip for these little guys, essentially, all right? And so one thing that the epididymis is responsible for is sperm storage. So as you probably could guess, those males are not just breeding things all the time, right? Um, we usually have a season where we want our animals to be bred. Um, for our goats, for example, their breeding season is gonna be coming up end of April, mid to, mid to end of April. Our cattle are gonna be bred um, right after Easter um, and then into May. So the, the, we have these scheduled times that we really want our animals to get bred. They're not just breeding all the time year round. Now, if we let them loose, that would probably be true, but Think about how many sperm cells are produced every single day. And if that animal isn't breeding every single day, where are all those sperm cells going? They gotta go somewhere, right? So in order to keep those sperm cells safe and to keep them in a spot where they could be accessed when they're needed, um, they are actually stored in the epididymis for an extended period of time. Now, because they are constantly making new sperm cells, that epididymis is emptied pretty regularly. If the animal isn't breeding, then usually the extra sperm cells are just um, filtered out through the urine. Um, so during urination, um, sometimes that epididymis is emptied just to keep the supply fresh, okay? so. Sperm storage is one of the primary um, responsibilities of the epididymis. Sperm transport is another one. This one is semi-minor, but they have to get from the testicles up into the penis somehow, and the epididymis is a route by which they do this. So they actually travel uh, from the head, down through the body, down the tail, and then up um, into the, the abdominal cavity into the penis. So. Um, sperm transport is one of the functions of the epididymis, 
And one of the major, major, major responsibilities of the epididymis is actually sperm maturation, okay? So when the sperm cells leave the testicles, they are not ready to go fertilize something, all right? You can think of them potentially as graduates of high school, all right? So when you graduated high school, you probably were a legal adult. Maybe you graduated early, but most of the time you're 18 when you graduate, right? So you are a legal adult, but are you a super mature one? Probably not, right? Um, and then you go to college and you undergo education and maturation. And by the time you graduate from college, you are probably ready to have a job. You are a more mature individual and you are ready to go off and you're ready to conquer the world, right? So you could think of sperm cells kind of in the same way. When they graduate from the testicles, it's like they're graduating from high school. They're not really quite ready to go yet. They have to undergo um, education and maturation in order to be ready to fertilize an egg. And that happens in the epididymis. Until they go through the epididymis, they cannot fertilize an egg, okay? So the epididymis actually exists in three parts. We have the head of the epididymis here at the top of the testicle. So the abdomen is gonna be up here, right? And then the scrotum is here and the bottom is down here, right? So the head of the epididymis is up here at the top of the testicle. And then you have the body of the epididymis, which wraps essentially around the side of the testicle. And then you have the tail of the epididymis down here at the bottom. Now, I will warn you that I recorded a dissection video and I got these backwards in the video. So I'm warning you now so that you can fix it um, in your notes as you watch that video, okay? So the head is here at the top, the body is in the middle, and then the tail is on the bottom, all right? That is the correct order. When I was recording the video, I was distracted and I made a mistake. So admitting it here, okay? All right, so sperm maturation in the epididymis occurs as the sperm move from the head through the body to the tail. So by the time they're in the tail of the epididymis, they are fully mature and they can fertilize an egg. And that's where most of the storage happens. So the storage happens in the tail of the epididymis. So when they first enter the head of the epididymis, very immature, and then as they move through, that's where maturation is going to take place, okay? All right, so the next part of the male anatomy is the ductus deferens, also known as the VAS, V-A-S deferens. Um, those terms are interchangeable, so you'll probably hear both at one time or another. Um, and the primary function of the ductus deferens is to transport. Transport the sperm from the epididymis up to the urethra and into the penis of the male, all right? so. This is the spot, if you were going to perform a vasectomy, this is where you would do it. So each testicle has its own ductus deferens, and if you wanted to perform a vasectomy, you would actually clip that vas deferens and remove a little suction of it, and then tie off each end. And that would prevent, <coughs> excuse me, that would prevent mature sperm cells from getting from the epididymis up into the penis. So they would still be ejaculating, they would ejaculate seminal fluid, but there wouldn't be any sperm cells present. Now we could do this for several different reasons. One of the reasons we do this is to create what we call teaser animals that are still producing pheromones and still producing testosterone that can help detect heat in our females and help bring those females into heat because they are smelling the pheromones. So we do this procedure. Um, you see it most often in sheep and goats, but sometimes you do also see it in cattle. You don't really see it in pigs because they use an intact male um, and they don't tend to vasectomize because they are mostly AI anyway, but you do see it a lot in sheep and goats. So the ductus deferens transports those sperm cells um, up from the epididymis to the urethra and penis. Main function is sperm transport. All right, so the accessory sex glands are um, located just before the penile tissue and there are 
essentially three different um, accessory sex glands. There are the seminal vesicles, which actually are a pair, and they sit on either side of that penile tissue. There is the prostrate gland, which exists kind of in between the seminal vesicles in the middle. And then there's the bulbourethral gland, or the, it's also known as the Cowper's gland, it's probably the biggest and it exists um, just before the seminal vesicles and prostrate gland. I'm not going to expect you to be able to locate these or know where they are, but you need to know that the accessory sex glands exist. And what they do is they add fluid to the sperm cells and they make up the final semen product. So it says, um, sperm there, but the sperm are the cells. So the semen is what is ejaculated. And semen consists of the seminal fluid and, it ex and the sperm cells. So sperm cells and fluid equals semen, okay? And this fluid that is added by the accessory sex glands is really important because one of the functions that it performs is nutrition nutrition. It is feeding those sperm cells and keeping them alive long enough to go and fertilize, excuse me, fertilize an egg. All right. Another thing that it's doing is it's acting as a buffer. So we've talked about buffers several times. And in the case of the sperm cells, when sperm are naturally ejaculated from the male, in most of our livestock species, that male is going to deposit his semen into the vagina of the female. So this is true for sheep, goats, and cattle. And then in pigs, the male actually ejaculates into the cervix of the female. But in those animals that ejaculate into the vagina of the female, the vagina is a very acidic environment. So it's got an acidic pH to it and sperm cells do not like an acidic environment. They prefer a more neutral environment. So the seminal fluid actually acts as a buffer to help neutralize that acidic environment and prevent those sperm cells from essentially dying on contact, okay? So the seminal fluid kind of paves the way a little bit for those uh, sperm cells. All right, it also helps to aid in coagulation, which helps those sperm cells move a little bit better. So does a lot of helpful stuff for those sperm cells. Um, there's a lot of hurdles from being ejaculated to fertilizing an egg, especially if they are naturally deposited in the female. Um, those sperm cells are naturally deposited in the female by the male. So if that animal is bred like cover, then those sperm cells have to go from the vagina through the cervix and the uterus up into the oviduct to be fertilized. And it's a long trip and there's a lot of things preventing those sperm from being successful. So um, one of the things that does help is the sperm or the seminal fluid. All right, so the penis is the copulatory organ of the male. So this is what is responsible for ejaculation and depositing the sperm into the female. And it actually has three parts to it. So the root is actually the closest to the inside of the body, all right? And this kind of goes up into the abdomen. And then there is the shaft, which is this part right here. And then there is the very end, which is, oops, sorry guys, which is the glans penis, okay? The glans penis is actually unique to the species. So this picture is a picture of the boar glans penis, and you can see it's got a very distinct corkscrew shape to it. And the bull and the ram and the buck all kind of have a unique uh, glans penis. And the reason that they are unique like this is because of how they breed the female. So it's kind of like a puzzle piece and it has to fit with the female. All right, so the glans penis has a lot of sensory nerves to it. Um, and it is essentially the homologue, so uh, the male counterpart to the female clitoris, all right? So very, very innervated, um, which allows the male to sense where he is in the female tract. 
and allows that male to get stimulated and ejaculate. So stimulation of the glands penis is really what triggers ejaculation in the male. And like I said previously, the morphology or how the glands penis looks is different for each species. So when we talk about bulls and boars and rams, and also bucks, which buck isn't on here, but when we talk about sheep, it's usually true for goats as well. Um, they have what's called a fibroelastic penis structure. So fibroelastic penis structure means that their penis is composed of tissue that is more like cartilage. So if you feel kind of the um, tip of your nose and you kind of wiggle the tip of your nose around, you can feel a little bit the cartilage in your nose. And for these guys, they have a very similar cartilage structure in their penis. So that means that they don't really get an erection, that erection is there all the time. And so the tissue doesn't expand like a vascular penis structure does. Instead, it relies on muscles um, relaxing and contracting to get that erection process going. All right, horses are different because horses, <laughs> they're always different, right? So horses have what's called a vascular penis structure. So this is similar to horse, or I'm sorry, not horses, humans. Um, so what happens when the stallion gets excited is that blood flow to the penile tissue increases and it causes expansion of the tissue. And that expansion of the tissue is what causes the erectile function. And then further stimulation of the glands penis is what's going to cause ejaculation. So it's different in the horse than it is for any of our other livestock species, all right? So again, the morphology of that glands penis, the very end is going to vary with the species. So it's designed to fit either in the vagina or the cervix of the female. So this picture is a little bit fuzzy, but it's the best picture that I could find that illustrates all of our different livestock species all in one place. So here in the top left, we have the bull penis, and you can see that at the very tip, this right here is where that innervated tissue is going to be. And then we have the boar penis here on the top right, and his is a corkscrew shape because the shape of the cervix in a sow is also corkscrew shaped. So because the boar, when he breathes the sow, is going to be ejaculating into the cervix, he has to have a way to get into the cervix of the female. And so his penile shape complements the shape of her cervix. So the ram, and this is also true for the buck, has a little kind of um, piece of tissue down here. This is called the urethral process. And when the ram and the buck ejaculate, this little tiny tube actually spins around really, really fast. And this is where the sperm come out. And so it spins very quickly and essentially coats the inside of the vagina with all of the sperm cells. One of the downsides to this an anatomy is that we talked a very briefly about um, urinary calculi. And when these guys get urinary calculi, often those little tiny crystals lodge right here and it will plug up their ability to urinate. So sometimes cutting this off will help alleviate that and it doesn't seem to impact their fertility, but sometimes the plug is here in the actual um, <clears throat> uh, root and shaft of the penis. So the urethra you know, is threaded up through here and oftentimes the, the plug is somewhere up here and you can't really do anything about that. But if this part is cut off, it doesn't seem to affect the fertility. So they're really not 100% sure why these guys have this urethral process here. 
all right? And then here we have the stallion. So again, the stallion has a different penile structure. So they have a vascular penis structure and you can kind of see just looking that the difference is pretty pronounced. So this is because when these guys um, get sexually excited, they have an increased blood flow, which is causing that tissue to expand. All right, so the sigmoid flexure is a little S-shaped um, configuration that is in the penile shaft. And this is true only in those animals with a fibroelastic penis structure, okay? So this is what helps these guys um, get their, I don't know, you could call it erection, but it's not really, um, it's their, I mean, it is, but, um, because they don't have expansion of their tissue, the sigmoid flexure is where the penile tissue is stored when the animal isn't sexually excited. So it's essentially retracted up into the abdominal cavity until the erection occurs. So there are muscles, one of them called the retractor penis muscle, that keeps that sigmoid flexure in place when that animal is not sexually excited. And then when that animal does become excited, those muscles contract and help push that penile tissue out of the uh, pupus of the penis and out so that the erection can be seen and that animal can breed the female. All right, so again, only present with animals that have that fibroelastic penile structure. This is a picture of what it looks like. So here we have the testicles down here, and then here's the vas deferens or the ductus deferens up here, and then this is where the penile tissue starts right here. And you can see it kind of comes down and around, and then it has this very distinct S shape right here, all right? And then here we have the glands penis down here. So this is the sheath right here. So this is the part you can see, but you don't just see all of this penis structure out here all the time. The animal has to be excited. And so there is a muscle and the muscle starts right here and it kind of connects right here. And that's called the retractor penile muscle or retractor penis muscle. And when the animal gets excited, that muscle contracts and it straightens out this whole structure, okay? And the reason that the penis has to be kept up inside the animal when the animal isn't excited is because this structure, like your cartilage in your nose or the cartilage in your ear, it can be broken. So if that animal gets injured, that tissue is really, really hard to repair and it doesn't heal on its own very well. Just like if you break your nose, um, unless it is treated very carefully, your nose is generally crooked for the rest of your life. And for these guys, if their penile tissue gets broken, which can happen, usually that animal can't be used anymore as a breeding animal. And oftentimes they're, they're euthanized. So the reason that this is up in the abdomen is to keep the animal safe from injury. All right, so this is a picture of the entire tract, and I have a video for you dissecting a tract as well. But here, down here, you have the testicles, right? One on each side. And then here is the vas deferens, here on each side. Um, you don't get a real good shot of the epididymis, but you can kind of see the tail of the epididymis down here, and then the body kind of wraps around here, and then the head here. You'll see it a little bit better in the video that I've recorded. Again, don't forget that I get them backwards in the video, so correct that when you're making notes, okay? So then you have the vas deferens here. There's one here, and there's one here, all right? And then these are the seminal vesicles here. And then this little kind of uh, bulge right here, that's the prostate grant, gland. And then you have the cowper's gland, which is right here, kind of in between this. This is muscle right here, but this kind of darker spot is the cowper's gland, okay? And then you have the penile tissue, which is all of this right here. And then the glands penis is here at the end. And then this muscle right here, 
this is the retractor penis muscle. So this is just to help you get a visual of everything that I was talking about. And you're also going to be watching the video. So you're going to get a pretty good idea of what all this looks like, even though you cannot see it necessarily in person right now. All right. So that is the end of what I have for you. And I want you to go and watch all of your videos for lab and um, let me know if something didn't make sense. And I will be talking to you soon. Bye guys.